And I think it's it's worth reiterating again that because I, I often see and we, we've seen why are you even working on names? Why are you even working on tokens? Those are non problems right now. Those are nobody's complaining about that. This is there are bigger return on investment items that you could be working on. I want to reiterate that Dan can work on what Dan wants to work at because uh, what Dan wants to work on because he's passionate about it and because it fits within what he's working on, his vision, his application. It's part of his grander scheme or grander application vision. That does not prevent the ENF who works for all, that works for all token holders to work on these other things which are currently happening through the working groups, um, through other initiatives, through funding things like Pomelo. The ENF can fill the gap of things that token holders might believe are higher return on investment right now and are real problems to solve. For those that say Dan is attempting to work on problems that aren't problems, they can happen at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. It is the first time that we are in this position. People need to, to, to recognize that, yes, this is the first time we're in that position. One is not excluding the other. We may have times, and we will have times, it's, it's inevitable, that we're going to have competing ideas. Dan's going to say, I want X, and the working groups will be a good example. They'll say, Should we've done research in the last three months. We think Y. You think X. We think Y. There's competing and then ultimately, the ENF or the block producers ultimately will need to decide which direction they go in. Now, at some point, like Dan mentioned earlier, if every single time, and this applies to Dan, but not just to Dan, to others as well, if every single time the block producers side with, in this case, there's only two parties in this example, but let's say the block producers always side with the ENF, then at some point, Dan will say, well, why am I building here? He'll go elsewhere. At the same time, if the block producers all always side with Dan, then people are going to say, why am I building here? I'm going to go build elsewhere. It's the first time that we have that challenge. It is a challenge, but it's important to note that these things can happen. They're not mutually exclusive. They can happen concurrently and they are happening concurrently. And that is more powerful in my opinion. And I believe in Dan's opinion as well for this process to be the process than to just default to one organization that decides for everything, which we've tried for the last three years and it does not work. It presents its own challenges. Usually the ideas are not mutually exclusive. We can adopt my name approach uh, without impacting anybody else because no one else is thinking about names. It's not a problem to them. Their only complaint is they have some other priority they want done. And so it turns into a well, if the block producers are having their attention on this name thing, then they're not having attention on my thing, right? So that back to that single threaded mindset. And so we need to recognize that just because I'm advocating enhancements in one area, it doesn't mean we can't simultaneously have enhancements in other areas. You know, there's entire system for virtual accounts, contract auth, uh, new token standards that need to be tried. And all these things can have a lot of consequences as, as you integrate to the broader ecosystem, but some of them can happen in parallel. Uh, and that's usually more of a attention, you know, single threaded mindset of don't think about that. Think about me um, mindset. And I think we need to say, no, think about them both. Right. And, and so we can demonstrate that other proposals aren't making forward progress despite not conflicting. You know, if, if there was a conflict, like someone has a different name proposal, and they're willing to champion it and, and it's more robust, we can try to figure out well, how can they both coexist simultaneously? And then it's who's going to invest the money to make it happen. And I think one of the beautiful things about what ENF is doing is it's funding both. Why? Because it knows no one can be God and know it's just going to work. One or the other might be more popular, might have more traction. And until it's out there, we don't know. We don't know who's building the killer app. Until it's out there, we can't debate about it. We can't, we can't gather feedback. We can't figure out which approach may be better. Right. Until you try to implement something, you don't know how long it's going to take to implement it. So if I have my team build a couple smart contracts and say, they're ready to go. All the block producers have to do is sign it. It's been tested on a test network. Meanwhile, other people's ideas are still in the, oh, I have this idea. I haven't flushed it out in a blog post. I haven't even written any code. 
you need people to move forward to actually implement things to even consider. And the things that get adopted are going to be the things that people are self-funding, building, and trying to get deployed. And every single thing I do, I build a contingency plan for what happens if the network doesn't adopt it. Uh, Because I need to make sure that I've got a roadmap that I can count on for my business, just like every other business does. So if my name proposals don't get adopted, all right, what's my plan B? If my token symbol allocation doesn't get adopted, what's my plan B? If, you know, a lot of the reason that I'm presenting these things to the network is I want to enable people to create standardized tokens and tools to be built against standardized tokens uh, and for decentralized communities to issue tokens uh, without having to deploy smart contracts that are managed by centralized development teams. Uh, There's all kinds of liability associated with managing that as as well as security. We've got a governance system on EOS, the block producers. If EOS provided uh, a token issuance symbol allocation service uh, that allows communities to use without deploying code and to have free upgrades and and other mutual benefits because you're, you're on the standard system, that helps the entire ecosystem deal with liability. And that helps me build apps that I couldn't otherwise build because of needing to structure things uh, properly so that I'm not doing, I'm not a money transmitter. I'm not maintaining code that's facilitating tokens for users, but that's a protocol level feature. Everyone benefits when a decentralized protocol uh, supports those types of features. Over this, then we're we're really talking about EOS right now, right? At the EOS level, which is one EOS IO iteration. Now, how does that fit in the plan of all EOS IO iterations? That's why the so the ENF recognizes that again, this is the first time that we're in that position. There was no distinction before. Block one controlled the EOS iteration, the EOS IO iteration, basically everything. Everything was funneled through that. We're now in a position where, all right, EOS has to make business decisions for itself. Likely, each network seems to be that the consensus so far, it's not that it's formal, but that likely each network will have its own flavor of EOS. And that usually happens at the system contract level. But then there are certain things that are going to be common to all of them and certain features that all EOS IO iterations would like to implement at the protocol level, like we talked about earlier. The ENF is also funding a working group to figure out what that would look like. What would be the process to determine hey guys, we're going to do something in EOS, which you can't tell us what to do or what not to do. And likewise, in another iteration, you're going to do something which other networks can't tell you what to do or not to do because that's a business decision for your own network. But where do we have commonalities and where do we think that it makes sense to work together on something because all of us want this? So a good example that that was brought up uh, in the last few weeks was faster finality. Seems to be right now that if there was faster finality, most of the EOS IO iterations, I haven't seen anybody that'd be against it, but most of them, if they could, they would want that feature. So then we also need to develop processes of, all right, in our sandbox, what are our governance processes and how do we do this, this competition essentially of different ideas that vying for attention, but also at the larger sandbox of how do all EOS IO iterations do this concurrently one against another and together as well. It's the first time, again, that we're in that position to do that. So, and, and it's happening live. I need to stress that, that the process that you're seeing is happening right now. There is no magical guidebook. There is no roadmap that, that's already predetermined that we are following. We are figuring it out because we've never had to do so. We're figuring it out all together right now. And part of what the ENF essentially is funding through Dan as well, and what we funded when the ENF funded the Eden uh, 1.0 process, was to figure out ways where maybe we can scale that governance on-chain to be able to come and help those processes. But we also recognize that whatever is the output of that may take a long time. In the meantime, We still have to innovate. We can't wait for five years until all of this is done. So we need to do something kind of patchwork. In the meantime, right now, the way we're doing it is through the working groups. Right now, the way we're doing it is Dan and I getting on calls like this, Dan and I having calls, me and the working groups having calls, the working groups and everybody else having calls, 
we're doing it live. It's really important for people to recognize that. There is no magic solution. We're trying to figure it out. That is one of the functions. One of the things that people need to realize is that when you're coming together with a group of people, right? Like all the different USIO you know, chains. Yeah. You know, if you have an opinion and you want it to go a certain way, what skin are you providing? Because it costs everyone else time and money just attempting to hear your opinion and synchronize with you. Right. And so there's a, and this is a problem with all community building in general is there's uh, an investment you have to make in building the relationships and reaching consensus and doing things with people. And the benefit from that collaboration has to be greater than the cost of the collaboration. Right. And so if there's a feature that all chains want, like faster finality, and all chains want to offer an opinion on how that's done, each of those chains and each of those parties needs to provide enough of a contribution to that effort. Maybe it's in the form of providing one of their developers, maybe it's in the form of providing some funding. But if they're not providing enough contribution to justify the time to hear from them, then it's um, it's kind of leeching and slowing the progress of consensus building on everyone else because you're asking for an opinion and you're not you asking to be heard and you're not contributing. Uh, and that's one of the challenges with with working with many different chains. Uh, and it's great. And I'm a big fan of trying to be inclusive in what, what Eve's doing with EOS Network Foundation. But I would uh, highly encourage that we moderate our desire to incorporate opinions of of communities that aren't contributing anything other than, you know, they're either complaining that we're not doing it how they want it or, um, you know, put some skin in the game and then you can have a voice, I guess, is my, my stance. I'm building on EOS um, and, you know, I've got lots of skin in the game for, for EOS, uh, but it'd be nice to see these other chains in these working groups if everyone puts skin in the game because I think that that is the only way that we're going to have a successful cross-chain collaboration that makes sense. Because otherwise all the EOS folks or all the WAX folks or all the TELUS folks are like, you know what, I'm out here just faster just working my own team because there's not enough benefit from the collaboration to overcome the cost of the collaboration. And that's what the EOSIO plus working group is going over right now. It's this idea that by default, it will be easier and it would be easier to just all go our separate ways. It will be harder to figure out a way to work together. And so that is the challenge that the EOSIO working group is trying to figure out. If there was a membership, what would that membership look like? Who would be a member? Is there a cost to be a member? What would be the governance process? Is it, is it an entity? Does it need to be an entity? Who gets a weight? Who gets a say? How does that work? All of this, again, we've never had to do before. So we're trying to figure it out. Um, and what think, are the synergistic benefits associated correct. with EOS adopting a change that or, to, or slowing its development schedule, right? Because that's the cost. The more people involved, the slower it goes. So EOS slowing down how fast it can achieve faster finality in order that other chains might also achieve faster finality. What do we benefit? by them having faster finality and what do they benefit by us having faster finality? What do we benefit from the feature they want and vice versa? Uh, and if there's not that mutual benefit, then all of a sudden the incentives are, are misaligned and it's altruism at, at a certain point and altruism only goes so far. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's one of the challenges. I think the main thing that we could benefit from is, is sharing liquidity between all the chains. Uh, as we, uh, if we have aligned economic incentives, so their success results in our success and vice versa, then uh, we have incentive to work together. As long as our tokens are completely independent, there's no liquidity benefits associated with it. There's no um, shared infrastructure, right? If, if we're building a wallet, can that wallet be used on their chains or not? Um, that type of uh, thing, like we need to identify the things that we're funding that all chains can use. It's not just can they use it, but if the other chain has it, it benefits us. Uh, does it allow apps to work on both chains? Are we supporting bridging 
or are we building silos? And all those things have to be considered as we're considering um, joint efforts that it will necessarily slow down the rate at which EOS can develop to the extent that we have to wait for this larger group of people to come along, right? It's like, well, I would say that that challenge exists on their side as well. They're looking at EOS and saying, why is EOS slowing my progress down? Right. So it's, it's not, exactly. it's not, so Mutual. that's why it's important that it's EOS is not above everybody else and everybody else is slowing EOS down in actually for, I would say for the last three years, in a way they innovate way faster than EOS has and EOS has been slowing it down and EOS has been pulling it down from a branding perspective, from a narrative perspective, uh, oftentimes from a code development perspective. All of this is what we're trying to figure out right now. And then I would even go further. So when Dan mentions that there are certain aspects that we need to consider, right? So we mentioned earlier, there's some technical aspects, there's some, there's some uh, maintenance aspects, there, there, there are things that we need to consider on how do we deploy, when do we deploy, what will happen next? Well, there are things that are also a little bit less tangible, like branding, like marketing, like past history, like business. Um, there, there are other things that the ENF has to consider that Dan considers for his application, which may conflict with what we are considering for the ENF, for the network as a whole. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's fine. And so I, again, need to stress that we will not always align. But overall, I think Dan had a really good um uh, analogy earlier of if you're looking at the North Star and you're trying to figure out where to go, both of us at this point, I think that includes not just the ENF, but the working groups under the ENF, the other chains right now, everybody's looking at, all right, let's go generally in that direction. We may have slight differences on how we plan on getting there and we may turn the lay when somebody else is turning it right or whatever. But ultimately, there does seem to be alignment on, let's go to the North Star, generally in that direction. If we don't take a step forward and all we do is just wait on, well, should we go 178 degrees or 179 degrees or 180 degrees? Ultimately, we're just paralyzed and we're not moving. We're not doing anything. Moving though, then we moved a little bit. We moved you know, one step forward at 178 degrees. Shit, other people didn't like that. And that maybe wasn't the right move. We should have went 179. Great. Now we have more information. Now we figure out. Now we need to adjust a little bit more to the right. And we do this frequent iteration over and over and over more rapidly than we've ever been able to do before, which is more challenging. It's definitely more difficult. It's definitely more stressful. The alternative is not doing anything. And we've been there. It doesn't work. Yes, you have to be willing to fail. And you have to accept that uh, you know, some failure is better than not taking the risk at all. Um, you know, well, and miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Yeah, and, and right. analogy failure is not bad. Yeah. Failure means that you've tried. Not trying is bad. Failure is not necessarily bad. How you deal with failure is what we have to now um, perfect. How do we deal with when things don't work out or when there are tensions or when there are conflicts? That's where now a lot of the focus is. But that's a better problem to have than let's not do anything and let's, let's be scared of what might happen if we do do something. Yeah, the biggest analogy I can have here is from the history of EOS, right? When we originally uh, released the code and the community launched it, there were a lot of people saying, it's not tested enough. We can't go forward, right? And so their proposal was effectively test it more until I feel comfortable that this thing's not going to break. And that could be one month. It could be six months. It could be a year. There's always going to be someone who says, I don't feel like it's quite ready yet. Uh, in which case, you know, they're worried that if something breaks, we might have some downtime, Right. Oh, the network hung up and it took us 24 hours to fix it. Okay, you still released it a month earlier. If you wait a month to try to find this bug that you might never have found, uh, you have a month of downtime effectively in order to save a day of downtime. Uh, so we have to understand that uh, it's okay to have some downtime because the alternative is to have downtime while you're waiting, effective downtime. It might not be like the whole network's down, but you might not have a new feature that you want, right? This new feature is not here for six months. We have six months of downtime for that feature because we are unwilling to release it earlier uh, and take some risk. Now, obviously there's some benefits here and you have to do some analysis, like what's Always the worst scenario, right? But we Ultimately, know- Ultimately you make a decision, right? Ultimately, 
decision paralysis is the problem. And we see that the market values those that experiment and those that innovate more frequently. So you talk about downtime, Solana, famous right now. I think it's the third time in a couple of weeks they go down. The market values that more than not doing anything. EOS, it's clear the market does not value not doing anything. So when people talk about, Dan, why aren't you focusing on price? This is, in a way, focusing on price, on trying to innovate. That is what the market is telling us. The market is not telling us that the name is important or the token symbol is important or the blue paper is important. The market is telling us, try to do stuff, try to innovate, test it out, get it out there. You, if, like Dan said, you might think that this is the idea. Well, the market might tell you it's not. But if you only tried one and you spent six months doing this thing, it's possible it won't even work. It's possible the market won't react. It won't care. You just wasted six months. Instead of in that six-month period, trying 100 different things, one of them sticks. And that one thing that sticks brings everybody else up. And everybody benefits from that one thing. But in the meantime, yeah, it was difficult because everybody was running in parallel and everybody's stepping on each other's toes. But the market values that. We see that. It, 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 that's non-arguable. We see that EOS has lost that competition in big part because it does not try to innovate. It stagnates. It doesn't do anything. There's no news. There's even the news that some blockchains have gone down actually increase its price because it went down because of, because of, because of. You never know, but the idea is you never know until you try. And, and we have this paralysis of let's not try because we're afraid to fail. Let's not try because it's difficult. Let's not try because we're putting ourselves out there because we're, we're going to be victim of criticisms because people will shut us down because they have, they have a better idea, a better solution. So let's just not try. And this is where we're trying to completely change the narrative of Let's try. Let's try a lot of different things and let's fail. let's fail. Let's fail frequently, often, but controlled. So it's also important not just to go willy-nilly and just, just you know, spend on everything and basically not have any processes. There is a balance, but it's definitely not the all or nothing, try without any accountability or don't try anything at all. We're trying to find where that medium is and that's going to change continuously. That's an ever-changing, whatever, needle. We're trying to walk that fine line. And yes, it is a fine line, which means that sometimes we're going to fall on one side or the other. That's okay. It's fine. Yeah, some things can be reversed and some things can't, right? For example, if you had a bug that resulted in everyone's private keys on the entire network being exposed, you can't recover from that. Um, but pretty much anything else you can recover from because all a blockchain is, is consensus. And if everyone knows what should have happened, then the network might go down for a week while we code things up, we reset state. Go, all right, that's the kind of like worst case extreme uh, scenario, but it's all recoverable with you know a, a minimum amount of downtime. Um, and by taking certain precautions, the ability to say, hey, things are getting out of control, just shut down the network. Okay, Let's figure things out and then bring it back up. Uh, that might seem like inconceivable to a lot of people. How can you shut down the network? Well, at the end of the day, all you really cost people is a little bit of uh, liquidity during the time that they couldn't transact. It's massively inconvenient. Uh, but as a startup growing, you know, that's, what, that's what you're risking. It's not saying that that's what's going to happen. I'm just saying worst case scenario, if that were to happen, would that be the end of the world? No, we've seen other chains that have had that same thing happen. It's not the end of the world, right? In the history of BitShares and Steam and EOS, there's been a number of times where there was some bug and it caused the network to halt and we got it back up and running in hours or a day. Um, and then the network went on. And now no one even remembers those events anymore because in the grand scheme of things, that one day of downtime was uh, not the defining factor. It didn't kill the network. And as the network matures, the probability of that happening decreases and you get more and more safeguards. So we can design these things so they fail safe rather than failing in an unsafe way. And you know, there are also project. other iteration or other considerations as well, where for <coughs> the Solana example, uh, it, the, the Solana example, Solana right now has a lot of momentum. So they have a little bit more leeway to fail. 
the threshold of what happens when they failed is probably higher. The market doesn't react as much. Whereas EOS maybe right now doesn't have the luxury of failing as often to that extent, the extent that Dan just mentioned of network shutdown. So again, the balance is ever changing. Maybe right now the changes that we propose aren't changes that might ultimately lead at the worst case scenario to breaking the chain. Maybe we don't have that luxury right now. Other chains have that luxury. We always, we, we consistently, or we continuously need to look at where we are and what is our environment? Where is our sphere of control? What can we do? What are the worst case scenarios? And that changes all the time. So there's not, that's again, there's why, not one magical solution. It's ever changing. That's why so much of my focus is on system contract, web assembly level changes. Those types of changes are very, very unlikely to bring down the entire network um, and can be fixed with a multi-sig and deploy in a new contract. Uh, so it's, uh, and that's why when I look at all the various proposals coming from different teams, anything that puts more logic into WebAssembly, I support. Anything that suggests more features at the core level, I'm generally against, unless those core features enable more stuff at the WebAssembly level. Because if we, you know, if we can get to the point where you know, we're no longer even ever creating accounts at the main level. And all accounts are created inside WebAssembly. And, uh, you know, that kind of um, flexibility uh, is going to be huge for the network overall. Um, so but the advantage to that as well is that then all EOSI iterations can have their own flavors much easier as well. Because then everything yeah. is at the system contract level. And so you want this flavor? Do you want this flavor? Do you want this flavor? And as long as we figure out how they can talk to each other, which is another advantage you mentioned before, if they're linked economically, or if we have faster finality at the protocol level, then the, the capability or the possibility of them speaking to each other very, very quickly then opens up more doors as well. Yes. Um, so you'll notice that on Ethereum, the ETH token is... A special case at, at the uh, it's not done at an EVM level. It's done beneath the EVM level. It's not the same as an ERC twenty token. But on EOS, our token contract is the same as every other token contract out there. Uh, even the election process, the delegated proof of stake process, all of that is done in the smart contract itself. We could go from um, the current way of selecting block producers to an entirely new way of selecting block producers without changing any, without any hard forking changes because it's all just system contract stuff. That's incredibly powerful. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think people realize that how, how great, how, how much of that in itself is a feature, which is kind of the base of EOS. It can upgrade itself while running. It's the changing of the, the engine in an airplane while it's flying analogy. Yeah, and it can do so without... You know, if you look at the fact that we launched the community, launched EOS, and it didn't need any hard forks until there was an intentional hard fork to upgrade something. There are no hard forks to fix anything. And any of the fixes we were able to patch at the WebAssembly smart contract deployment level. That's a huge testament to the, to the quality of the code that is serving as the foundation and to the design of, of EOS. Uh, and that's why... I, I want to move more in that direction so that some of the things that are still done, like resource management and accounts and, and whatnot, more of that stuff is moved into WebAssembly. Um, and, and we can emulate all of EVM inside of WebAssembly right now uh, and, and actually run more Ethereum contracts through our platform on top of the WebAssembly than Ethereum can. Uh, so there's, there's uh, huge architectural advantages that we should take advantage of. You mentioned EVM. So I, I think a lot of the issues recently are you're sharing ideas on things that other people don't necessarily think should be a priority, but they do mention EVM as a priority. That's still happening. And we don't need to talk about that because that's another working group. They're working in parallel. One thing that you're working on is something that almost everyone's agreeable on, and that is passive income opportunities and ways to earn for providing value to the ecosystem. 